enter, rejoice, and come in. Enter, rejoice, and log in to those joining us on Zoom. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. We come together by the light of our chalice flame. If you are joining us from home, we invite you to light a candle or a chalice along with us as we say our words together. We light this flame as a symbol of new life, enlightening our way, as a symbol of the warmth in every human heart. Let the lighting of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of hope, of peace, of love. May we share that light with all people. I'm Sydney Morris. I'm, hi, good morning. Good morning. I am your summer sub, Reverend Sydney, here while Reverend Christina is on medical leave. And I've been a fan of your congregation for many decades. I knew you in your old, uh, old spaces. And I'm so glad to be here today. If this is your first time visiting the fellowship, I want to extend to you a special welcome. We'd love to have you get connected here. You can talk with any of our staff or members, and especially our engagement team. They've got the rainbow lanyards on. After the service, have a chat with them or send us an email. Today, we welcome Dr. Elias Ortega as our guest to our pulpit. Dr. Ortega serves as the president and professor of religion, ethics, and leadership at Meadville Lombard Theological School, one of our two UU seminaries. As a lay leader, he served our larger faith in various volunteering capacities, among them as a member of the Commission on Institutional Change and the Religious Education Credentialing Committee. He enjoys knitting and long nature walks. It's time now to settle in and take a deep breath. Become aware of your body here in this room or wherever you are. Allow yourself to be fully present to this time that we have together. It is so precious. We're glad that you're here. At this very hour, we gather in worship to weave the strands of our lives into a larger tapestry of meaning. At this very hour, we are gathered in anticipation of discovering the shape our lives will take as we are inspired by songs, words, and rituals. At this very hour, we gather in hope that, may, that we may lay our sorrows and be comforted by the care of our community. At this very hour, we are gathered together in the love that holds us all, in the love that restores us all. Come, let us worship. Today, we're exploring what it means to gather as a religious community, what it means to worship together. We know that one reason we gather is to support one another. If you're ever in need of emotional, spiritual, or financial support, we are here for you. Please don't hesitate to reach out to our ministers. It's a joy to be able to offer help. And if you're one who's feeling stable and able to give, we ask that you do so in that spirit of generosity. There are many, many ways to give to the fellowship. You can give of your time and your talent. 
and we especially need financial resources to allow our ministries to thrive for the months and the years to come. If you're here in our building, feel free to come up to one of our ushers who's standing at the back of the sanctuary, or you could raise your hand and an usher will come to you. And for everyone else, we encourage you to donate online or through our text to give function on a smartphone. Thank you. Your gifts are deeply, deeply appreciated. Part of our commitment to each other is to bring our joys and our concerns to this time together. Taking time to honor those joys, concerns, and transitions in our lives allows us to share with each other so that our joys might feel multiplied and our sorrows divided. In a moment, we will share those joys and concerns that have been submitted to us by people in our circle of care. And if you are joining us on Zoom, you are welcome to share in the chat box whatever joy or concern or prayer request or intention might be on your heart and on your mind. For care and connection during the week, please do not hesitate to reach out to our ministers, myself or Reverend Sydney, or contact our office. If you'd like your news included in our weekly Joys and Concerns email or spoken aloud from the pulpit on a Sunday morning, please feel free to contact anyone on staff or fill out our website form. We now turn our attention to the joys and the concerns wider than this gathered community. We allow our minds and our hearts to reach out in ever widening circles outward like ripples in water. Our first stone that we place in our water this morning is for Uvalde, Texas, after the horrific school shooting this past week. Our hearts are broken we feel sad and angry and weary, so much so that it is hard to find the words to say. We wrap our hearts around everyone in Uvalde, especially the families of the 19 children and two teachers who were killed. We hold close all of our country's children and educators for whom active shooter drills have become far too familiar. We pray that we do not become numb to these events, knowing that this is not normal. Knowing that there is another way to be in our country. We commit ourselves to actions that are within our reach as we pray for an end to gun violence and for comfort and healing for all impacted. We add a second stone this Memorial Day weekend as we honor and remember all those who have lost their lives in service to their country and their community. 
We have some among us who have served themselves or whose family members have served. We lift up these individuals. We hold in our hearts the military families and loved ones who have endured tragedy. We pray for an end to all war and we lift up a hope for peace as one global family. We enfold all who are celebrating and all who are suffering in the embrace of our hearts. And we commit ourselves to acts of compassion and justice in service to those circles beyond our own. May this moment of silence help to make it so. Our settling song this morning is 101 Abide With Me. I would actually encourage us to stay seated for this with our feet rooted to the ground. This is 101 in the gray hymnal and the lyrics are on the screen as well. We'll sing all the verses.
Our first word of wisdom comes from the late Reverend Hope Johnson. We are one. We are one. A diverse group of proudly kindred spirits. Here not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. We are active and proactive. We care deeply. We leave our love as best we can. We are one, working, eating, laughing, playing, singing, storytelling, sharing and rejoicing, getting to know each other, taking risks, opening up, questioning, seeking, searching, trying to understand, struggling, making mistakes, paying attention, asking questions, listening, leaving our answers, learning to love our neighbors, learning to love ourselves, apologizing and forgiving with humility, and being forgiving through grace, and so creating the beloved community together. We are one. Reverend Sydney is on her way to be with our children in RE today. Thank you, Reverend Sydney. Our second reading is Hope. Oh, our second reading is Hope Rises by Reverend John Burens and Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker. Hope rises. It rises from the heart of life here and now, beating with joy and with sorrow. Hope longs. It longs for good to be affirmed, for justice and love to prevail, for suffering to be alleviated, and for life to flourish in peace. Hope remembers. It remembers the dreams of those who have gone before and reaches for connection with them across the boundary of death. Hope acts. It acts to bless, to protest, and to repair.
finding scope for faith in God. In the Spirit, let us travel open to each other's pain. Let our loves and fears unravel Celebrate the space we gain. There's a place for deepest dreaming. There's a time for a heart to care. In the spirit's lively scheming, there is always. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve, if we haven't met. Uh, normally, you know me as the director of music at the UU here, but my nine to five is as a professor. So I thought it would be appropriate to start with a test. <laughs> Jonathan, let's roll the tape here. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. <laughs> Got it? Just the people in white. How many passes did you count? How many? The correct answer is 15 <laughs> passes. But did you see the gorilla? <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. I love that test. I love it for the shiver of embarrassment the first time I did it. And I love, more importantly, that you never not see the gorilla the second time. <laughs> there are dozens of these selective attention tests. It's otherwise known as the invisible gorilla test. And I promise you, for the rest of your life, if someone shows you one, you're going to be looking for the gorilla. <laughs> and it, it inspires a deeper thought that there are a lot of things that we do and see that we're looking for one thing, but there are more things than that. I want you to picture in your mind's eye the FedEx logo, and you see the five letters. Some of you are nodding because you already know what I'm going to. There's an arrow in the word, but my brain wasn't looking for that. My brain was looking for the five letters. Jonathan, roll the tape. There it is. The arrow between the E and the X. And if you never noticed, did you see it now? Yeah, between the, between the E and the X, there's that arrow, right? And you'll never not see it now that you know that it's there. Every truck that passes by, that, that blue arrow is meant to, to fit between the E and the X, but I messed up on PowerPoint. You see it? <laughs> you'll never not see it now that you know that it's there. And what does this have to do with choir? We, <laughs> not much. In choir, we sing at all of the services, not just the first one. So we go to the first service and we take in the service the way someone attending service takes it in. Where's this poem going? I'm excited for it. Where's this worship reflection going? Brian's talking about cake. I don't know how this is going to land, but I'm there for it, right? And then the sermon and we're following it in real time and we're taking it in with our selective attention, right? And then we come back for the second service and we already know where it's going. And so we start to see the architecture of the service. We start to notice that I have now played for you three times and my life flows on an endless song before you even sing it before the closing hymn. It's woven its way into the service three times. So in the first time we go through the service, we experience a totality of it. We experience the feeling of the service. But the second time, the choir and the other ministers see the architecture of the service. And once you see it, 
you never unsee it. And so that is what I invite us into is, as we talk today about worship services, all the disparate elements that go together to make a cohesive whole in the service, the readings, the hymns, the reflections, the sermon, are all constructed to make one thing. And that is like a choir. You have these disparate people, right? You have a paralegal and a preschool teacher and an electrical engineer and a retiree, and you have high voices and you have low voices and you have louder and quieter voices. You have folks who like to read music, folks who like to learn music by ear. And they all come together like the worship liturgy itself, or as Hope Johnson would say, a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits, here not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. And may that be so. May it be so. Thank you so much for, for that reflection. Uh, it really, not only, I hope that you have noticed, not only, uh, sorry, and enjoyed the, the hilarity of it and the fun of it, but also the, in, the invitation, uh, right, to pay closer attention to what is it that we do when we gather together in worship with one another. So today I wanna to share with you words about how are we shaped by worship? And I hope that in these words, you hear an invitation to think deeply and deeper of the practices that we do when we gather. And I also want to say good morning to each and every one of you, whether you are gathered in fellowship in the sanctuary or joining us like I am via technology. It is my hope that throughout the arc of this service, you will find moments of comfort moments of inspiration and moments of transformation. I believe that we gather in worship primarily because we have made a choice and the choice is to be in community because it is in worship where we come together from our multiple walks of lives to find a moment of rest. We come to worship with our multiple beliefs, our many practices that restore us because we believe that worshiping together is a central act of our communal lives. It is in worship that we tell who we are and who we hope to be. It is also when we are gathered that we do so in a spirit of welcome. I will say that many of us are familiar with the words that oftentimes we hear in UU spaces. Whoever you are, whatever you are in your life journey, you are welcomed here. These are some of the words that you may be familiar with. They were penned by the poet Rumi, and they actually are longer. The verse goes like this, come, Come whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of living. It doesn't matter. Our caravan is not of despair. Come, even if you have been, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come, yet again, come, come. Perhaps we can say a word like this to one another. And we do so because we hold fast to being in community where we are committed to one another's spiritual growth and our responsible search for meaning matters to us. Whether we are wanderers who are seeking deeper meaning, exploring religious traditions, exploring spiritual practices, learning new songs and new ways of being, whether we are worshipers who are seeking a place to mourn the sorrows that have visited us upon our personal and communal lives, we come together in ritual with one hope, the hope of restoration. Whether what draws in is a love, a love that challenges us to live our lives at witness to justice in the service of others so that we can work together 
to shape our world into a better one. And even in those moments when we have fallen short of our vows of covenant with one another, we'll still find a welcome. To me, the words of late Reverend Hope Johnson reminds us of that. And you heard Steve also say that. Because we are one, a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits. We are here not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. We are active and proactive. We care deeply. We live our lives as best as we can. We gather in worship once again, not by coincidence, but because we have made the choice of weave our lives together. Worship shape us as a people. If that is so, then it is our faithful work to bear witness through the acts of our lives to the power of that message. I want to share with you a story of an experience that I have teaching a Sunday lesson to an elementary age group about the meaning of worship. On this particular occasion, I was invited by a local Christian church to teach a lesson to a group of one to third graders on the meaning of the colors of the liturgical calendar. As a teaching prop, I was using a calendar wheel that represented the liturgical colors of the various religious seasons. The goal was to connect what they may have noticed around the sanctuary, the colors of the vestments were by the priest, the particular difference uh, the particular difference between their high holidays and the days in between, and in particular to the rituals that the, that the community practiced. I asked the young humans in my class about the meanings of the various colors and their symbols. It was not surprise to me, but I actually expected that most of the high holidays, at least the names of them, if not their full meaning, were mentioned. They have a, a deep awareness of the things they did as a community during those days. For example, red for Pentecost and Holy Week, purple for Lent, white for Christmas and Easter, but green caused some confusion. Depending on your own religious journey, if you have familiarity with congregations that practice what is oftentimes termed high liturgy, you may require that green is prevalent in the Christian liturgical calendar. And this is not a nod to ecological dust justice although it might be possible to infuse several liturgies with it. But this particular group of humans, young humans, knew that green is used for epiphany season, but they were not sure why, because it was so prevalent during the year. The festives colored for the holidays with the reds and purples, the preparations and the rituals in worship that they did, the special food, the special lessons, set them aside as a moment of communion celebration. But the other Sundays, the green ones, for those first to third graders were somewhat bland, normal, maybe even the boring days where they have to come to church and there was not much going on. One of the children blurted out, well, I guess the rest of the green Sundays are optional Sundays. And I will admit that even I laugh for a moment but I decided to turn that slip into a teachable moment. And I said the following, you were quite close, I said. Those Sundays are referred to not as optional, but ordinary, meaning that they stand for those Sundays outside of the major holidays. So I said, and as I was saying this, these young children also pipe up one more time, just as I said, if they are not major, then they're ordinary and ordinary is optional and therefore it is boring. And we laugh again for another round, but a deeper realization dawned on me. In this particular faith community, there has been a failure of attention because you see there was intentional attention to the ways in which the emphasis was given to the special holidays. The changes of the rhythm of the communal life were marked. Many engage in the preparations and care to prepare their sanctuary for different events. They took care to practice the rituals that would mark the new season. They were engaged in deep practice, 
for the high holidays. However, the same kind of intentionality was not given to ordinary Sundays, and therefore they became optional. Because of this practice, they took for granted that ordinary times when the community gathered to worship is actually a moment of preparation for those other moments, for those high holidays. But regardless whether you are in ordinary time or in high holiday time, you are connected by one story, the story that give your faith meaning, the stories that bind us together as a community, the stories that shape our life so that we can live with hope into tomorrow. And I think that this may be a common reality in our faith communities, but it needs not to be so. It needs not to be so. Every Sunday, every time we gather, it is a special time. It is a time of a signpost of sort where we come to celebrate one another, to gain inspiration, hope, and comfort. These times when we are gathered are not optional times. They may be ordinary times, but these are the time in which the mundane of our lives get visited by the holy that we co-create when we are together. And that, my friends and beloveds, is not optional. Over generations, I think that as a community of faith, we have worked around uneasily around worship and liturgy, because given our multiple beliefs and our multiple faith traditions or lack of beliefs, we are trying not to offend, not to exclude one another. And at times it means that we do not offer each other enough sustenance. We have not taken to heart the reality that Jeffrey and Dave Davidson name about liturgy, that liturgy help us get the faith into our bones, into our flesh and blood and bones once again. For a liberator, a liberal religious communities as ours, this may have a different meaning because we are make the commitment to encourage one another and respect one another in our multiplicity, and yet we decide to come together. For me, that means that we take it that being a spiritual community means that we will find the inspiration in diverse sacred teachings, in ethical teachings, because we know that we can hold in tension our traditions and our being if we welcome the spirit of life to move in our midst, to birth the community that we are meant to be. For Bill Hooks, this is not so much about talking about God or, or the sacred, or even religious traditions. Instead, the spirituality that we can cultivate is about practice, how we live in the world and how we relate to the self and others. And I think this is true of our worship. Worship has shaping power. That power comes from the story that we tell ourselves of who we are as a community. And I hope that every time you gather in worship with friends and strangers alike, you take a moment to ponder the mystery of the hour, to be inspired by our songs and our messages, to renew ourselves day by day with a new commitment to bring the stories into the world to change a narrative of injustice into ones of justice, to change the narratives of suffering and pain and give them new ending of restoration. And more importantly, that our stories and how we worship shape our lives with dignity, grace, and mercy for one another and for the sake of the world. May it be so and blessed be.
Our hymn this Sunday is My Life Flows On in Endless Song. Uh, please stand if you like singing while standing. It's um, 108 in the gray hymnal, and the lyrics are on the screen as well. Our time together is coming to a close, which means our time to return to the world and to our daily lives is beginning. Please remember that there are always ways to get connected here, even online, and to live your faith more fully. Be sure to read our weekly scroll e-newsletter, or let us know if you'd like to be added to that mailing list. Check out the order of service on the back for some highlights about what's coming up. I want to offer a big thank you to Dr. Ortega for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. After the service, Dr. Ortega will stick around on our Zoom call for a discussion for anyone who would like to participate. Um, if you would like to, those in the building, I, I welcome you to remain in the sanctuary, move to the front perhaps. Um, and those on Zoom, you, may, you are welcome to stay on the Zoom call for that discussion. Everybody else, we welcome you to exit out the back doors afterwards and enjoy fellowship time in our fellowship hall together. And right now, before we close our time together, I would like to invite our beloved Director of Congregational Life, Marie Luna, up here. As you all well know, today is Marie's last Sunday on staff here at the Fellowship. After 16 years of amazing and profound ministry in our community, She's departing so that she can bring her gifts to the wider Unitarian Universalist movement. And I know that everyone here joins me in saying thank you, Marie. Thank you for all the beautiful ministry you have done here with us. Thank you for all the ways you have helped shape this community into what it is. Thank you.
I hope you feel that love in this room and from Zoom. And now we invite everyone to consider something from today's service that you wish to carry with you away from this gathering and into your week. Maybe a phrase, a topic, a song, or something else. Find whatever that is. It is our hope that it will provide inspiration and empowerment for you until we are together again. And now, please join me in our unison words for extinguishing our chalice flame, even as we continue to hold its warmth and light in our hearts. As we extinguish this flame, let us go our ways with hope in our hearts, with our spirits renewed, and with a deeper understanding of life's mystery. Let us carry the light of compassion and commitment to build a better world. And with that, go in inspiration and connection. Go in peace, knowing that we wait to embrace you upon your return. <laughs>